Already were they diminished in my frame, but my good fortune ended there. Longevity was far from immortality. I continued to entertain this belief for many years. Sometimes a thought stole across me. Was the alchemist indeed deceived? My habitual credence was that I should meet the fate of all the children of Adam at my appointed time. A little late, but still at a natural age. Yet it was certain that I retained a wonderfully youthful look. I was laughed at for my vanity in consulting the mirror so often, but I consulted it in vain. My brow was untrenched, my cheeks, my eyes, my whole person continued as untarnished as in my twentieth year. I was troubled. I looked at the faded beauty of Bertha. By degrees, our neighbors began to make similar observations, and I found at last that I went by the name of the scholar bewitched. Bertha herself grew uneasy. She became jealous and peevish, and at length she began to question me. We had no children. We were all in all to each other, and though as she grew older, her vivacious spirit became a little allied to ill temper, and her beauty sadly diminished. I cherished her in my heart as the mistress I had idolized. The wife I had sought and won with such perfect love. At last, our situation became intolerable. Bertha was 50, I 20 years of age. I had, in very shame, in some measure adopted the habits of a more advanced age. I no longer mingled in the dance among the young and gay, but my heart bounded along with them. While I restrained my feet in the sorry figure I cut among the nesters of our village, but before the time I mentioned, things were altered. We were universally shunned. We were, at least, I was reported to have kept up an inquisitive acquaintance with some of my former master's supposed friends. Poor Bertha was pitied, but deserted. I was regarded with poor indistinction. What was to be done? We sat by a winter fire. Poverty had made itself felt, for none would buy the produce of my farm and often I had been forced to journey 20 miles to some place where I was not known to dispose of our property. It is true we had saved something for an evil day that was to come. We sat by our lone fireside. Again, Bertha insisted on knowing the truth. She conjured me to cast off the spell. She described how much more comely gray hairs were than my chestnut locks. She descanted on the reverence and respect due to age. How preferable to the slight regard paid to mere children. Could I imagine that despicable gifts of youth and good looks outweigh disgrace, hatred, and scorn? Nay, in the end I should be burnt as a dealer in the black art, while she, to whom I had not deigned to communicate any portion of my good fortune, might be stoned as my accomplice. At length, she insinuated that I must share my secret with her and bestow on her like benefits of those I enjoyed myself, or she would denounce me, and then she burst into tears. Thus beset, methought it was the best way to tell the truth. I revealed it as tenderly as I could, and spoke only of a very long life, not of immortality, which Representation indeed coincided best with my own ideas. When I ended, I rose and said, And now, my Bertha, will you denounce the lover of your youth? You will not. I accursed arts of Cornelius, I will leave you. You have wealth enough, and friends will return in my absence. I will go, young as I seem and strong as I am. I can work and gain my bread among strangers unsuspected and unknown. I loved you in youth. God is my witness that I would not desert you in age, but that your safety and happiness require it. I took my cap and moved towards the door. In a moment, Bertha's arms were round my neck and her lips were pressed to mine. No, you shall not go alone. Take me with you. We will remove from this place and as you say, among strangers, we will be unsuspected and safe. I am not so very old as quite to shame you, and I dare say the charm will soon wear off, and 
With the blessing of God, you will become more elderly looking, as is fitting. You shall not leave me.